For the first year of its life, Game Boy had an easy lock on claiming portable gaming firsts. The first handheld scrolling platformer. The first proper portable football, baseball, basketball, golf, and soccer games. The first true handheld role-playing adventure, and so forth. After all, before Game Boy, the only portable gaming consoles had been Milton Bradley's Microvision and Epic Game Pocket Computer. The former was hopelessly primitive, while the latter only ever saw about six games produced for it during its brief life. Game Boy was first practically by default. As we near the end of Game Boy Works 1990, Nintendo no longer has the feel to itself. Atari's Lynx had debuted almost simultaneously with Game Boy in America, and while it was slow to get up on its feet, with only five titles released by the end of 1989, Lynx's library grew respectably through 1990. Then, in October 1990, a more significant challenger debuted in Japan ahead of its 1991 global launch, Sega's Game Gear, where Lynx relied primarily on Atari's internal development talent and a handful of American studios to produce the six dozen games that were eventually made for it, Game Gear would see hundreds of titles produced by many of the same developers who partnered with Nintendo on Game Boy. Ever since launching Game Boy Works back in 2014, I've been intending to cover the Lynx and Game Gear libraries in some capacity. But the standard works approach, one or two releases per episode, doesn't really make sense. Even so, I don't think you can really define the Game Boy's existence without showcasing the competition for the sake of comparison. So here's the compromise. I'll be tackling Lynx and Game Gear by way of Game Boy Works Gaiden overviews, pulling together four or five brief title summaries in each episode. Truly excellent or significant titles will receive the lion's share of coverage, but every game will enjoy some explanation to help provide a better sense of what was happening in the portable space in parallel to current Game Boy coverage. These guide-in episodes will appear infrequently, rounding up releases for entire months, seasons, or even years, depending on the volume of material published for Game Boy's rivals in a given period. We'll begin here by winding back the hands of time to August 1989, when the Atari Lynx hit the US market with a colorful, somewhat uninspiring thud. As a production note, since people frequently ask, these Lynx retrospectives are being recorded from original carts on a modded Lynx 2 system. The console has been recapped, enhanced with a McWill screen, and fitted with a video out mod, whose signal is then upscaled to 720p by way of an OSSC and FrameMeister for recording. There's no better place to make our links to the past than with the system's hero title, Epix's Blue Lightning. It's a fairly shallow and somewhat dull game, but no launch title better demonstrated Lynx's technical capabilities than Blue Lightning. The title hints broadly at the content of the game. It's an obvious riff on Blue Thunder, a mid-80s American film and television series about an advanced attack helicopter. Blue Lightning, then, is its fighter plane equivalent, and this, of course, is a military combat sim. Blue Lightning takes its real inspiration, obviously, from Sega's arcade hit Afterburner. We've already seen one attempt to capture the bone-rattling essence of Afterburner on a home console with Konami's Top Gun, and frankly, Blue Lightning arguably does a better job of it. It's not a better game, lacking any real variety in its enemies or combat objectives, but it's definitely better looking. The Lynx's graphical chip was based around many of the same tech elements as the mighty home computer graphical powerhouse, the Amiga, which had also been designed by Lynx's engineers, RJ Michael and Dave Needle. Although the system's horsepower had to be scaled down considerably to be able to run on batteries and fit within a screen resolution of 160x102 pixels, Lynx could perform some impressive graphical feats. Resolution aside, Lynx could compete favorably with high-end consoles like TurboGrafx-16 and Sega Genesis, both of which were launched in the US within weeks of Lynx and Game Boy's debut. American game enthusiasts didn't lack for new hardware options in autumn 1989, with two new consoles and two new handhelds all vying for consumer dollars, alongside some of the finest NES and PC games ever made. Blue Lightning was the game to make the case to skip those others via Lynx. Blue Lightning delivers an impressive imitation of Sega's famous superscalar arcade technology in a handheld format. There's a great deal of sprite scaling and rotation on display, and during the more heated moments of combat, the screen is absolutely covered with moving objects, enemy crap, missiles and their contrails, explosions and shrapnel, and lock-on indicators, all flying at the player as a detailed abstraction of the ground rolls beneath the action. Of course, Blue Lightning had a few advantages in its favor, not least of which was that its programming was handled by Brian Bauhey, one of the Lynx's hardware designers. If anyone knew how to squeeze performance out of the machine, it would have been Bauhey. This also offers a helpful glimpse into Atari and Nintendo's respective priority. Bauhey focused on stunning visuals and white-knuckle action for Blue Lightning to showcase the handheld's beefy innards. Meanwhile, the Game Boy shooter directed by its respective hardware designer, Satoru Okada's Solar Striker, focused on simplicity and clarity to ensure everything looked and played smoothly on Game Boy's murky screen. 
Blue Lightning is a fast-paced game in which you control an F-18 Hornet as it streaks over the landscape and guns down enemy fighters with a combination of chin turret rounds and lock-on missiles. Unlike in Konami's Top Gun, you're spared the frustration of trying to refuel and land your fighter each mission. The downside is that this means there's just not a whole lot of gameplay variety available. It's pretty much all flying, all shooting, with the only variety coming in the scenery you navigate, which mostly just amounts to background wallpaper. You shoot down enemy craft, take out ground emplacements, juke and dodge to avoid return fire, and that's about it. There's a small amount of variety within missions, most notably in the form of sequences that require a nap of the earth flight. Here you discover the ground is not just a flat sheet, but rather consists of sprite-based topographic details that your plane can indeed smash into. Blue Lightning does include a simplistic password system that allows you to input the four-letter word you're given upon completion of each mission to continue your adventure at the next stage, rather than being forced to start from mission one each time. Given the battery-hungry nature of the Lynx hardware and the rather lengthy missions, it's entirely possible that players might not be able to complete the entire adventure on a single set of double A's. So it's not the deepest game, but as a launch title, this can probably be forgiven to some degree. As a sales pitch for the graphical potential of Lynx, Blue Lightning was a real attention grabber certainly more so than Game Boy's Alleyway. If we want to make an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, it was closer in spirit to TurboGrafx's China Warrior. Visually stunning, but also dumb as hell and shallow as a pond. It's a fun, pick-up-and-play shooter that still looks pretty darned impressive 30 years later. Not a bad way to kick off the Lynx's life. And the Jaguar CD's life, too. An expanded remake of the game would ship in 1995 to help showcase that system. Though by comparison, that one looked a lot less convincing in that context than this dazzling 89 release did. There's a whole ugly backstory about the Lynx's development and how Atari came to own and distribute the system. Although that's outside the scope of this particular episode, in short, computer software powerhouse Epix created the Lynx and Atari funded it. But along the way, Atari allegedly manipulated the process to squeeze Epix for cash and force them to hand over all rights to the system. This is pretty much business as usual in video gaming, unfortunately, but on the consumer side, it meant that Atari's new system launched entirely with a lineup of Epix developed games. Of the five debut titles, California Games was the one with any name cachet, to the point that Atari packed it in as a free game with the console itself. California Games was the third entry in Epix's Games franchise, which debuted with Summer Games, an unofficial tie-in to the 1984 Summer Olympics. The USSR had boycotted the 84 Olympics. Good evening. The Soviet Union will not be taking part in the 1984 Olympic Games to be held in Los Angeles. Allowing the US team to walk away with a ridiculous number of medals, and Summer Games was one of several Olympics-themed releases to ride the crest of that athletic patriotism to bestseller status. A Winter Olympics-themed follow-up, Winter Games, arrived the following year, with California Games debuting on C64 and Apple II in 1987. California Games breaks ranks with the series by having nothing whatsoever to do with the Olympics. It's basically just a bunch of casual, amateur sporting events loosely tied together by the guiding notion that kids in California probably enjoyed doing this kind of stuff. California Games for Lynx is a much more convincing computer-to-console conversion than Winter Games on NES was. It helps that Epix program this one internally rather than outsourcing it to Atelier Double, and that the Lynx was graphically a more capable system than the NES. What California Games on Lynx does share in common with Winter Games on NES is a sense of incompleteness. Just as Atelier Double trimmed several game events in order to fit Winter Games onto a cartridge, California Games loses two of its six minigames. Roller Skating and Flying Disc, what kids these days call Ultimate or Ultimate Frisbee, have been relegated to the realm of PC exclusivity. Remaining, we have surfing, halfpipe, skateboarding, footbag, and BMX. All four events use completely different control schemes and work under different rules. BMX is by far the most complex, essentially working like Nintendo's Excite Bike, seen from an isometric viewpoint. You zip up and down hills, pitching your bike forward and backward to maintain your balance on the slopes, all while trying to dodge road hazards. The slightest slip up will cause you to spill from your bike and lose time, but the viewpoint makes the game controls incredibly frustrating. The halfpipe event can also be vexing, since you're basically just have to sort out what you can do and when as you roll around the pipe. Should you lean into your movement, reverse your direction, or kick off? California Games offers no guidance, and any error results in a wipeout and a do-over. The result is a trial and error process that involves a lot of failure and a lot of scolding. Surfing is equally abstract, though less punishing. While wipeouts are very much within the realm of possibility, the design of surfing is a little more lenient. Your goal is to simply stay ahead of the crest of a wave and perform as many different tricks as you can without dropping off the bottom of the screen. And finally, Footbag is the calm counterpoint to the do-or-die vibe of the other events. It's Haggy Sack. 
You're foot juggling a beanbag, basically. All you do is bop a little bag into the air and try to keep it aloft by bouncing it with your feet, knees, and head. It's pretty chill since mistakes don't end the game and the controls are wholly contextual. As long as you tap the action button as the beanbag drops to where you can bounce it back up, your big challenge is simply to move left and right to make sure you remain under the bag. Overall, California Games is not what you'd call a system seller, but as a free pack-in, it was a decent enough way to pass the time. The most traditional game in the Lynx launch lineup, Gates of Zindicon, is a traditional side-scrolling shooter. However, it more closely resembles late 80s hits like Gradius or R-Type than it does older shooters like Defender or Parsec. Its leisurely pace makes for a less intense experience than Blue Lightning, and its lack of a meaningful power-up system makes for a less dynamic shooter than was the trend in 1989. Gates of Zindicon has a minimal power-up system, allowing you to collect a handful of supplemental weapons that work like Gradius's options and R-Type's bit. But it's the power down system that's more interesting. At the beginning of each stage, your fighter craft wields three weapons, a piercing laser, a bomb, and a shield. Each weapon is triggered through different means. Tap the B button, you'll drop a bomb in a lazy arc. Hold B and you'll fire a sustained laser beam. Hold A and you'll deploy a shield. The weapons also double as a life bar. Your ship can absorb three hits, which it does by shedding one of its weapons. As you take damage, you lose access to different attack options one by one. Once you lose your final weapon, you lose your ship as well. Gates of Zindicon takes its name from the space gates that appear at the end of each of the dozens of stages contained here. Your goal is to reach each gate without being destroyed. Once you enter a gate, a space pit crew allows you to trade your damaged fighter for a fresh new one. With something like 50 levels in total and a variety of different enemies appearing in each, Gates of Zindicon is a pretty big game. It's also pretty dull, moving at a pokey clip and basically consisting of new enemy formations filling the screen. On a technical level, it's pretty impressive, the Lynx can once again throw around a lot of stuff, especially once you collect the power-ups. But it's not the kind of game you really want to keep coming back to. It's more a distraction than a hobby. Far more ambitious is Greg Omi's Electrocop, which has been described as a sort of spiritual successor to Epix's PC classic Impossible Mission. You know, the game that seemingly inspired Zillion. Electrocop, who in no way should be mistaken for Robocop, runs around a maze of traps and computers attempting to hack open doors. The game is set in a futuristic Washington, D.C. where, yes, criminals have kidnapped the president's daughter. This isn't 24, though. There's a real-time component to Electrocop's quest, but you only have one hour, not unlike in contemporary 1989 release Prince of Persia. The similarities to Prince of Persia begin and end there. Electrocop isn't a 2D platformer with an emphasis on trap evasion and sword combat, it's more of a maze action game with limited gunplay and 3D maneuvering. Here we see Electrocop's big selling point. It's a visually impressive game, maybe even more so than Blue Lightning. Rather than playing out as a rail shooter, Electrocop takes place in a maze-like environment seen from the ground level. Honestly, it's difficult to describe the visual style and tech here in terms of another game. In my experience, it's kind of unique, though perhaps understandably so. The closest thing that comes to mind might be something like Delphine's Fade to Black. It's ambitious, but it doesn't work all that well. Essentially, Electrocop takes place in a series of rooms designed on a grid, and you can move around them in four directions. Rather than viewing this action from a top-down perspective, you instead look into the world almost like gazing into a shoebox diorama. Your hero, who looks like a cross between Robocop and Judge Dredd, occupies the center of the screen and the camera is essentially fixed to him. As you move left and right, the camera pans with you. But you can also move into and out of the screen, and the camera moves along with you then as well. The entire game world and everything in it scales up and down depending on its relative distance from the camera. It's a pretty stunning effect for a handheld game from 1989, the kind of thing that contemporary consoles couldn't have pulled off anywhere near as elegantly. Compare this to something like Super Thunderblade on Genesis, and Electrocop comes off looking great. Unfortunately, this visual technique is also incredibly confusing, and makes for a tiresome chore of a game. But still, you have to respect the ambition. The majority of the action in Electrocop consists of walking through the maze, avoiding and shooting enemies, and trying to maneuver around traps. The timing on many traps can be tricky, and you'll take a lot of, frankly, unfair damage as a result. The action is really more or less a sidebar to the core of the game, which is hacking doors. Each stage has one or more doors leading to the next stage, and in order to unlock them you need to find a computer terminal and activate an icebreaker program to reveal the door code. Terminals are interesting because they offer much more than simply code-breaking tech. They allow you to deactivate traps and robots in the current room to make navigation easier or to recharge your health. They also provide a comprehensive database on enemy robots and available weapons, so you can read up on the capabilities of the bad guys. A highly unusual in-game feature for 1989. You can also kill time by playing video games, including thinly veiled versions of Asteroids and Breakout, which you'd think could have been called by their proper names here, since those were also Atari titles. But remember, Electrocop was originally intended as an Epix release. 
Why would you want to kill time with a one hour clock constantly running in the background? Well, your icebreaker isn't the most efficient program ever, so it takes a little while to crack the door code. Playing Breakout is a safer way to while away the moments than wandering around through rooms full of bad bots and laser barriers. Curiously, the door codes are not randomized with each playthrough, instead they're fixed. So that tells me Electrocop clearly wasn't meant to be completed in a single playthrough, but rather through multiple cumulative sessions where you jot down codes for future reference, skipping the icebreaker sequences. All in all, it's a pretty neat idea for a game, and definitely a remarkable implementation of Lynx's sprite-pushing technology. It's also very difficult to get into three decades later, where the challenges and rules of navigating 3D spaces have been refined and perfected. But messy as this may have been, there was nothing like this available for Game Boy, ever. It's a game that truly set the Lynx apart at launch. Ironically then, the best Lynx launch title is the one that would have felt most at home on Game Boy. Chip's Challenge, designed by Electrocop co-creator Chuck Somerville, is the one Lynx launch release whose creator seems to have intuited the fact that handhelds and puzzle games go hand in hand. Chip's Challenge consists of 144 stages in which a computer geek named Chip has to collect microchips and other items in order to unlock the exit to the next stage while avoiding various abstract monsters and overcoming environmental hazards. There's even a bit of box pushing, because every portable system needs Sokoban at some point. What really makes Chip's Challenge stand out is just how huge and varied it is. The process involved in gathering computer chips is rarely the same from level to level. There are a great many puzzles to be solved along the way, but it's not all just brain teasers. One stage may simply consist of gathering hundreds of chips from a large room while dodging monsters, only to be followed soon after by a level where you easily collect a single chip and then scramble to navigate a harrowing maze to reach the exit. Chip's Challenge always keeps you on your toes with its constantly shifting mechanics and design. The bulk of the core mechanics are introduced early in the game. Things like dirt blocks that can be pushed into water and stepped on to create a new block, or special power-ups that rend you invulnerable to passive hazards like fire. There are remote control switches that activate machines in the environment, bewildering mazes of moving floors, monsters that follow your every action and can only be obstructed by the same computer chips you need to collect, and more. It's a rich, imaginative puzzle game that arguably blows away anything we've seen on Game Boy through the end of 1990, and that's a lot of competition. Chip's Challenge doesn't do much to take advantage of Lynx's tech. It runs at a faster, smoother clip than its Game Boy competition, and occasionally you'll encounter a stage with a lot of moving elements, but otherwise it's pretty sedate compared to Blue Lightning or Electrocop. And that's fine. This is the kind of game whose mechanical and puzzle design do the heavy lifting. Chip's Challenge doesn't need to wow the masses with mind-melting sprite effects or background staling because it has 12 dozen imaginative action puzzle stages to keep players engrossed. It's a lengthy, substantial game, and its quality is highlighted by the fact that it's made its way to at least half a dozen computer platforms in the following years, an honor afforded to very few Lynx originals. Somerville created a sequel to Chip's Challenge that hit Steam alongside the original game in 2015 after the completed game languished in rights negotiation hell for more than a decade and a half. In addition to the port of the original game, Chip's Challenge 2 also comes with a level editor, meaning it's a rare Lynx game that continues to be playable and worth playing decades after its debut. Unfortunately, Lynx would prove to be short on games on par with Chip's Challenge, but the fact that it had any games of this caliber does speak highly of the platform and the passion its creators had for it, even if Atari did its best to quash that enthusiasm.